Hello, everybody. Welcome to Rewind Dynamite. It's John Pollock and the 39-year-old Wei Ting joining us for one final time. How are you, Wei? I'm doing very well. Yes, thank you. Uh, the last day, the last uh, two hours of my 30s, actually. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, I honestly don't really think about it at all. Like, I've had people remind me um, a lot more than me thinking about it myself. Yeah, it seems everyone's got the same jokes. Um, Which that. are? Do you feel old? Are you still able to move? Yep, feels. I, I feel fine. I feel. Just <laughs> Is that fine. even a joke? I don't know. It's like, uh, you hit <laughs> forty, and then uh, suddenly there's a countdown clock uh, above your uh, mortality. So, well, way I hope you have a wonderful day on Thursday. Thank I you. know you will because you're spending at least ninety minutes of it with me because we are going to be doing the Ask Away Mailbag Show on Thursday. So you can ask Way. What, what it feels like to be 40 on Thursday. <laughs> Go to forum.postwrestling.com to get your questions in by Thursday morning or memo.fm slash postwrestling if you want to hear your voice. Postwrestlingcafe.com is where you can go to catch the show as well as all of our extra shows. Double Double and Espresso members, you know where it's at. Today, you were just scrolling through your podcast and there, nine minutes of me talking to myself and clips galore. You've got it made, don't you? It, I mean, it really is is a great way to catch up on the rest, all the wrestling news. I mean, um, John, in addition to everything he does, uh, spends time several days out of the week to read to you, to talk to you about all the news that he writes about on the website in John's news updates. So maybe I should just start reading things. to be like instead of reading books to myself, maybe I should just like this is uh actually this isn't out yet, but I'm in in the process. Of this, uh, this this new Macho Man book, which. Uh, uh, I feel like there might be uh, like a legal issue with yeah. doing that. You know, you'd be probably infringing on people. What if I said based but... on a true story and I just made it up about uh, Sandy Kravage and just... you could probably get away with it then. Yeah. yeah. Quite honestly, the, I, I'm only like a third of the way through it. Very extensive in terms of the baseball stuff with, with Savage. Really hmm. like some stuff I knew, but like other, other things like, like the man had an obsession about becoming a professional baseball player and kind of having to come to the terms that here's someone that spent a good, like pretty much his adolescence and teenage years obsessed with getting better and having to come to the conclusion. I'm only like for his city and like, he was a very good player, but at the major league level, he just was not at that, that talent level and having to sort of come to that. Can you imagine just like, focusing on something so intently and obsessive and you just have to realize you're not good enough for that next level well sure yeah i mean it happens with people that want to become professional wrestlers at, at the highest level what mm -hmm. what what uh position did he did he play he was a catcher yeah oh interesting wow yeah so what a different life that would be yeah the author is going to be uh joining me in a couple of weeks as well so we will uh talk a little bit more about the uh the, the name of the book i don't did you mention the name of the book? it is called the untamed unbelievable life of randy savage by john finkel um that is uh it's out in two three weeks something like that there's a bunch of books coming out uh in the becky lynch has a book coming out ronda rousey has a book coming out jim ross has a book coming out and there's also um this interesting book about kind of the history of it, it kind of is uh, a book, it's on wrestling, and it's sort of broken up into figures from WrestleMania 1 and sort of deep dives into these figures. And anyway, it's uh, it's an interesting book, but part of it looks into like the early expansion years of the WWF and interviewing some of like the key people that were there behind the scenes. It's called, um, boy, I'm just blank. I've read the book and the name... I will have it in my next news update. Okay, folks. So it is by Brad Bellucci. And that is the name of the author. The name escapes me right now, but it's it's coming out soon. So that's like five wrestling books. If you are a reader out there and, and want to check it out. 
Is it um, the six pack on the road yes. in search of WrestleMania? That is it. That is okay. it. The six pack. Very. Go. It started out to be like a biography of the Iron Sheik. So it's sort of this author's journey of kind of getting excommunicated from the Iron Sheik, then reconnecting with him later in his life, obviously before he passed away, but also doing profiles on these different wrestlers. And one chapter is dedicated to the expansion years of the WWF. And I found it to be um, it is some really enlightening stuff as well. So there you go. That that cool. has my recommendation. All right. On that note, uh, again, coming up uh, later on this week, besides Ask Away, we also have Rewind to Smackdown Friday night with myself and Mr. Ting. And then Saturday, Collision Course with Kate from Montreal, John Ceno. And then Sunday night, get, up, get ready to buckle up with Two Way Ray as he brings together Nate Milton, Chris from LA, and Andrew Thompson for the NWA podcast. Lots that they will have to discuss, and that will be live Sunday night up on the post YouTube channel. A must listen every single month. Yes. And uh, we have a lot coming up just on this show alone because we are going to have the Nord VPN ad. That will, <laughs> that will be uh, momentarily. It will be, uh, it, it, will, it will be coming your way. So stay tuned for that. John uh, sent me like a text during the show of his notes and in big block letters. Like I'm talking size 300 font. Nord ad size 72 uh, bold. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, we'll see if you remember Got it right here. I've got it right here. If I miss this one, then I mean, you might have to fire me. Um, there you go. Let's get into the news. Unless there's anything way, any, any other words you want to share before we dive in? I let's, let's go into the news first. All right. Want to start off with the story that, um, man, this was just a, a heartbreaking story to read about involving Mark, the hammer Coleman, who we talked about pretty extensively, not all that long ago when we mm -hmm. reviewed the smashing machine and he was staying at a home. I believe it was like a rental property that his parents were involved in. It was Tuesday morning and this house fire began. And Mark Coleman, who himself, he's 59 years old. This is a guy that has had like hip replacement surgery. He entered the home to get both parents out and was able to protect them. And then went in another time to go save his dog could not save the dog who, who perished in the fire. And Mark um, basically had taken in so much uh, smoke and had to be airlifted to a hospital. So he's in very serious condition at the moment. It was uh, significant. The, the house was totaled from the fire. There were seven fire departments that responded to this. Again, he had to be airlifted. And we've been getting some updates from his daughter, who has been posting online, as well as Wes Sims, who's been a longtime friend, training partner of Coleman's. And they had started a GoFundMe, which is uh, linked um, up on, uh, if you go to my my Twitter, I do have the link information, but they raised about $50,000 today for Mark Coleman. Actually, they're above the goal now, but man, um, it's certainly a very, very serious situation that, that he's in, obviously would have, you know, inhaled just so much uh, smoke and doing just such a heroic thing here for somebody that is not in the greatest of physical condition himself because of just all of the years that he's been through. And here he is entering a burning home to save his parents and then a, a dog on top of it. I mean, it's just, you're, it, it's a really heartbreaking story. Uh, I, I, I mean, it's, it's something so unbelievable that it feels like it's, it's out of a movie. Um, the fact that somebody could even manage to save two lives uh, like that. Um, I, I, I it, 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 it's unbelievable almost. And um, you, you really, really, really hope the man is able to pull through and make a, a recovery coming off of this. Um, I, I can't imagine how awful that situation is. Yeah. Um, our thoughts are with Mark Coleman, his, his family. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you can support it, um, we will make sure we have the, uh, the GoFundMe information out there as well. Yet another member into the WWE hall of fame class Thunderbolt Patterson, who was not a name I was expecting to be going into the WWE Hall of Fame. Thunderbolt Patterson, um, at, at one point in his career, he was a fantastic talker and a big draw in a number of territories, including Georgia and uh, several other places. Started his career in Kansas City in 1964 and then got the name Thunderbolt from uh, promoter Jules Strongbow in Los Angeles, but he went all over the place from Texas, uh, California for uh, WWA, as I mentioned, Georgia, Florida, Jim Crockett promotions uh, in Australia. He wrestled as Sweet Daddy Brown for Jim Barnett 
And then also in Ann Gunkel's All South Wrestling, um, on top of that, in, in Detroit with the Sheik, where he was one of the few that got like a clean pin on the Sheik for the U.S. title for a very brief uh, title reign. And in the 70s, he was part of a racial discrimination lawsuit involving a Bearcat Wright and Ron Pope. And he was someone that was very outspoken about the, the treatment of black wrestlers and feeling that they were discriminated against, that he himself got blackballed. And, you know, he gained this reputation of being somebody that was both outspoken and then got that label of someone that was just very difficult to deal with, which at times, you know, you can certainly see some parallels with like a Bruiser Brody, who was someone who just did not take uh, kindly to promoters that he perceived was trying to screw him and would be sometimes would go out of his way, like would um, not not wrestle at a show and would go in front of the crowd to make sure they saw that he was there and then was leaving and would do like strong arm tactics. And with Thunderbolt Patterson, um, you know, you can, you can look at it. Like he was somebody that was, um, you know, very difficult for some promoters, but was also someone that I, I have no doubt experienced uh, horrific racism throughout his career. Um, but that has been, you know, he was someone that was very, very outspoken in an industry where um, you can certainly be one that is uh, ostracized for being outspoken in an industry where you don't and you're rewarded for not talking about the ills of the industry and such. And he was one of the more outspoken ones, but um, he was also part of the WCW discrimination lawsuit, um, alleging various racist behavior by different WCW officials, a, a case that you could certainly do a, a deep look into. And it's, it's some horrifying allegations that uh, are made about just the culture at WCW uh, at the time. And he had previously gone into the George Tragos Luthez Hall of Fame in 2019 and now into the WWE Hall of Fame. He's 82 years of age. So um, I'm imagining like if he is, uh, you know, physically fit to, you know, he's, he still does the odd conventions here and there. So I imagine that he will be there. Um, but yeah, he was, he was not a great wrestler by any stretch, but, um, especially at, for, for a long period. I mean, just, he was a fantastic promo. And then, you know, throughout the eighties, like you, you saw him sort of just like his promo ability did, um, it did deteriorate at one point, like he got voted like worst on promos by the observer, like in 85 or so. But I mean, you can, you can certainly, there's not a ton out there, but there's some that you can watch of him that he was a very, very effective talker and, and a draw in particular in Georgia that a lot of promoters continue to always go to Thunderbolt Patterson, Ole Anderson being one of them. And one of, one of, even it was mentioned in the WWE story was that um, I can't remember how they worded it, but that, you know, Dusty Rhodes got, you know, some of his influence from him. And that was something that a lot of people looked at. Like here was Dusty Rhodes that took a lot of Thunderbolt Patterson when it came to uh, his, his verbal, his verbal presentation as well. Is it a selection that surprises you? Yeah, I, it was not one that was on my radar that they would be putting in um, th this particular year. I mean, there's whenever I look at at, at somebody that especially at the age of 82, um, you're glad that someone gets this sort of a spotlight while they're still alive and that mm -hmm. they can still be presented um, to. And, and someone that really did not have any like wwwf ties like it, with the with the mcmahon family i mean he was more so somebody that was like a territorial star m many different territories but didn't have that that lineage of um with the wwf itself now there has also been this like poster that has been circulating around the hall of fame this year and there was an update today so i guess on this poster way that's been going around the outstanding names that have not been listed uh include Leah Maivia and Bray Wyatt. Mm -hmm. And today, um, Dave Meltzer had an update confirming uh, through WWE that Leah Maivia is going in and will be inducted, obviously, by Dwayne Johnson. Uh, but the WWE did not confirm Bray Wyatt. So that doesn't mean he's not going in. It just was not confirmed in that report. And potentially, I mean, it would seem to make a lot of sense that, that Bray Wyatt would be maybe the, the person they announce at the end as going in. And mm -hmm. there's sort of that expectation that he will. I, especially when they're honoring uh, Barry Windham and Mike, Mike Rotunda and it being, you know, the first Hall of Fame since his passing, it, to me, makes a whole lot of sense that he would be going in there. But Leah Maivia will be. Yeah, I, I think you're referring to the Reddit post. 
Yes. Is that right? Yeah. Which I think Reddit is even taken down. Yeah, it looks like I just tried to click on it. Uh, it's from a poster named Alex YY77, and this came out seven days ago before the U.S. Express was even announced. And in succession, I mean, this list came true with the U.S. Express, um, uh, Muhammad Ali, and, and now Thunderbolt Patterson. And, and if that's those are you know guesses, I I don't know if you'd be um, listing Thunderbolt Patterson as a, as a wild guess. So this person seems to know what, what is up, and I I would expect at this point a Bray Wyatt to be announced at the end as well. All right, so that's on the uh, the Hall of Fame front. Logan Paul uh, announced on his podcast on Tuesday, confirming uh, Fightful's original reporting that SummerSlam will be going to Cleveland on August the 3rd at Cleveland Browns Stadium. This is the second time SummerSlam will have taken place in Cleveland, the last being 1996 with Shawn Michaels and Vader. Um, but this will be the event coming up uh, August 3rd. So this will be a month after Money in the Bank. So if we look at the post-WrestleMania premium live events, they are going for Backlash in France in early May. The Observer has just reported the next Saudi Arabia show is May 25th, which is going to be the same weekend as Double or Nothing. So that's a Saturday-Sunday back-to-back deal. Always look forward to those weekends. June, I'm thinking there's probably nothing before Money in the Bank. There's With two shows in May, probably June, there's nothing. And then July 6th is Money in the Bank, and then August 3rd is SummerSlam. Do we know and then any- they've got that that Berlin Germany show at the end of August as well. That the bash in Berlin is at the end of August. Site fees attached to almost all of those in some form, right? Ye- Do we know what's up with Cleveland? Cleveland, um, believe so, but I'm not 100% right. sure. Toronto, I, I don't think there's any site fee attached with Toronto, mm-hmm. no, but France, right. or Germany, um, Saudi Arabia, if you want to call that a site fee, it's it's mm-hmm. money um, that that's coming their way. So, I mean, especially on the international locations, you would be uh, looking at that. So, do you think we'll be going to Cleveland way? I mean, it's it's kind of a close drive, so it's a it's very possible. Sure. Would we go back to the museum? Um, you mean the Hall of Fame? That I mean, Museum Hall of Fame, same thing. Oh right? yeah, yeah, yeah. So maybe we'll make our way there. The New Japan Cup uh, continued today. I did watch the two tournament matches. Uh, Hikuleo fell to evil. Uh, you wouldn't believe this way. They had uh, all the members of the House of Torture get involved. Uh, tons of run-ins. This no, this really. match was just a... I was amused. It was a comedy of errors at the beginning, okay? Because the story was that evil was going to go after Hikuleo's knee. So he goes after and attacks him from behind on the left knee. So... Evil is working over this left knee over and over and then sends him to the floor so Dick Togo can work the knee. But unfortunately, Dick Togo was either not paying attention or just didn't care because he starts working on the other, the right knee instead of the left knee. And even Walker Stewart notices this and is just, (laughs) oh, he's going after the right knee. They don't want to give him an inch to breathe. They're going. So then he rolls him back in. Evil goes back to the left knee he had previously been working. And then I'm guessing Togo realized because later in the match, he starts going after the left knee. And I was just like, this is just, this is so entertaining for me and me alone. So that alone, cool. Then like all the House of Torture come out. Phantasmo and Tangaloa came out to take them all to the back. So then with all the allies gone, no House of Torture members, uh, Evil just avoids the godsend, chop blocks the knee and pins him with everything is evil. So uh, w- wonderful baby face uh, falling here to evil in 14 minutes and 33 seconds. And his opponent in the next round will be Shingo Takagi, who defeated Gabe Kidd. Uh, they had a 18 plus minute match. Um, g- good match. I wouldn't say it got to uh, incredible levels, but it was a satisfying main event. They Kidd took a lot of the match uh, before the end where he did this... Uh, lariat tombstone combination and spit at shingo takagi and that gave him his uh his his extra powers he came back with a pumping bomber and the last of the dragon to win so we have friday show that has zack saber jr against ren narita and el phantasmo against yoda suji that wraps up the second round and then the quarterfinals begin on saturday and the quarterfinals will feature jack perry against sonata david finley against hiroki goto evil against takagi and the two winners from friday with the tournament wrapping up next wednesday Cool. So always remember what need to work over. That's that's the lesson from today's New Japan Cup. All right. Uh, continuing on here to some uh, 
boxing news way, because coming up on June the 1st, it's a rematch from UFC 244 as Nate Diaz is going to be taking on Jorge Masvidal. Uh, this is going to be taking place in Los Angeles on the same night as a UFC pay-per-view with uh, UFC 301 scheduled to take place this, uh, or sorry, 302, I believe, to take place this night. So that is interesting. And this pay-per-view, which is being presented by Fan Mio, uh, which is one of these, you know, online sites that love these kinds of fights. Um, the pay-per-view is going to be offered for $79.99, or if you order by April the 12th, you can get it for $49.99, which I never encourage uh, people to buy fights uh, two months in advance when the fight could very easily fall apart or something could happen. But if you want to save those $30, um, you, you do have that offer. So we are going to see how, how interesting... Um, this will be in terms of a rematch happening in boxing. They're going to fight at 175 pounds. It's a 10 round boxing match. And yeah, you have this and you also have the Mike Tyson, Jake Paul fight coming up on July 20th. And I would say that I feel the Tyson Paul fight is going to be a pretty big deal. I think Netflix is going to put all their resources into promoting this. It's also not coming with an $80 price tag that this fight is. And we don't even know what will be on that UFC pay-per-view, but that's, it wouldn't be the, um, I would not be going head to head with the UFC pay-per-view. The pay-per-views are so big at the moment for UFC. And I, I just think that that is a core audience that you would be wanting to attract for this. Um, but we'll see how it does. What is the strategy behind going head to head? Maybe their thinking is by going head to head, that creates a story in and of itself that you have this head to head battle. Um, mm. I just like, I really question how interested MMA fans are in seeing these two fighting in a not their chosen sport. And I mean, these, you know, we saw Nate Diaz, like he did fine against Jake Paul last summer. Um, fine would be about what I would characterize it as. I think people would, um, this would, I would say even as an MMA fight at, at this point, it would certainly have more interest, but I, you know, it's, it's both guys that are that many years older. They fought in 2019, but they're, they're big names. That's what, this fan Mio project is, is relying on, and I'm sure they're going to get um, some good promotion for it. But I also thought that for the Jake Paul fight, and it's not like Nate Diaz did a whole ton building up that fight either. So um, it looks like we've, we've kind of gone on this like ebbs and flows of these celebrity boxing fights, and we're kind of going back head first into them. And I, I just somewhat question what is the, is there that big of a market uh, for this as a standalone pay-per-view the netflix thing i'm i'm not intrigued by the fight but i'm intrigued by the um the business uh attempt that netflix is making because that that could have a you know a a trickle down effect in terms of their attitude towards these one-off combat sports events do you do you think you would you would like not having to pay for it that mm -hmm. you will out of curiosity watch this mike tyson jake paul fight given that yeah. yeah. Are you curious just to watch it, knowing that you don't have to pay for it? You don't have to uh, look for it on alternative means. It's just it's there for you. The answer is yes. Yeah. yeah. I'm, I don't know if I'd necessarily watch it live, but um, after the fact, you know, if I, I'm not already sort of um, satisfied with what I might be seeing through scrolling. I mean, if it's already on my Netflix, Netflix account, um, I think the answer is yes. And then some ratings notes, and then we will get to Dynamite. So we had... Um, Raw on Monday night doing uh, 1,751,000 viewers and a 0. 0.56 in the 18 to 49 uh, demo. WrestleNomics reporting the peak came between 9 and 9.15, which really is the uh, the the golden quarter. And having, uh, well, we should give some credit because this was the backstage segment with the Judgment Day and R-Truth, uh, but primarily the Cody interview with Michael Cole, this spike to almost 2 million viewers and 835,000 in the demo, an increase of 9% from the previous uh, quarter and also benefited with uh, with no ad break on top of it. So it was like a clear spike uh, performing above all other segments on, on Monday. So all of the, the key main event players for WrestleMania, they are, they have the lion's share of the interest. I think you can see. And then NXT on Tuesday night uh, down to 588,000 viewers, a drop of 10% and a 0.16 in the demo, which in the, 18 to 49 demo was their lowest since July the 4th, um, which of course means they were up in, can in Canada by 17% from last week. So 
Canadians took a pass on roadblock, but man, they, they were ready to come back and see the return of the old Thea Hale. And um, Trick and Lash having a bit of a makeout session on TV. Yes, uh, you got that for mm-hmm. the, uh, the the final, you know, the final segment to build up, um, you know, Crick Williams for Noam Dar next week. Yes. So, um, and collision. Here on, uh, collision numbers. Uh, yes, if you uh, pull them up here and uh, scroll down, as I don't have them in front of me. Uh, we had 427,000 viewers and a 0.13 in the demo. So this was the second week in a row that the, they, they were taped. So they were down 6% in viewership from the week prior. They are back to live this Saturday night in Ottawa for Kyle O'Reilly's return. And that is all they announced for Collision tonight was the one match with Kyle O'Reilly and Brian Keith. Yeah, it's, I believe so. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm sure Ottawa was just uh, ecstatic when they got uh, one match announcement and then they loaded up Toronto for next Wednesday. Toronto really does seem to be their priority. I mean, it's not unlike the past week. You know, Collision is just kind of there. You bring the best for the Coca-Cola Coliseum. Well, here on this particular show, we don't play any tricks on you because we bring you only the best. (laughs) Okay. Let's let's listen to more from our own. Wait. It is 2024 and tracking technology from advertisers, ISPs and hackers is getting more sophisticated than many of us can understand. Something you can do to give yourself a bit more peace of mind this year is to protect your browsing by investing in a trusted VPN like NordVPN. Voted Best VPN for Privacy of 2023 by Security.org, Nord is one of the most established and reputable VPN providers in the field. NordVPN is also something I use every day to access geo-blocked online streaming services like AEW+. By far the best way of watching AEW programming commercial-free with on-demand access to AEW's entire TV archive. But perhaps the most value I've gained from using Nord has been the ability to unlock cheaper prices to online content from other parts of the world. And from now until March 20th, when you sign up at nordvpn.com slash postwrestling, receive four bonus months at discount pricing on all two-year plans. Plus, users in the U.S., Canada, U.K., and Australia receive an Uber Eats voucher valued from $10 to $30 with their standard, plus, complete, or ultimate plan. Again, that's nordvpn.com slash postwrestling. Sign up for as low as $2.91 a month and enjoy some free Uber Eats, along with all the benefits of a premium VPN like Nord's. Thank you very much for that, John. You know, I could make these a lot more genuine as someone that legitimately uses this thing every week, and it's been a life changer. Feel free. I will try because it's um, it's a lot better than what I was doing prior. It's uh, I can pause mm. now. I, I can know. Breathe. I've, I've been saying all this for months now. It's weird to be able to like you know go go to the bathroom during dynamite. I mean. Mm-hmm. Things that you just took for granted. Although at, at some points, I, I feel like I am I have to watch it that much closer because the commercial breaks, you get to see everything, right? So there is more watch time. Yeah. yeah. And if it wasn't for Taz, I don't know how engaged I would be. But the man, that has been the revelation of, uh, hmm. of watching on AEW+. Plus. Well, tonight we had a big business from the TD Garden. And so... Uh, tonight, Russell Ticks noted um, 9,400 plus tickets distributed, meaning that on Wednesday, they moved around 2,000 tickets on the final day. Hmm. That's an incredible amount of movement for uh, an AEW show, really for for anybody. Um, but that was you know significant. And for what we talked about in terms of this strategy of Mercedes Monet, um, you know, she dropped that uh, just the Boston tweet today and that probably was enough of a did spur on like some movement and they got a ton of tickets that ended up uh getting sold on the final day so by 9400 tickets like that that's a very healthy number for aew especially these days overall if they're in a similar situation in the future do you think that they um, would implement a similar strategy of, of basically only hinting ever so slightly about a person's arrival I think it always depends on the person and I can't even think now of all this influx of talent. I don't even know who that next person would be that you would have this degree that you would do that strategy. I do feel like when it is the right person, I think Tony does like this, this strategy of the, and, and the fact that you have built it up, like there's never been one of these like swerves or something where, you know, the fans feel like they get burned in the, in the end It is 
but I do think you, you always go to just try to maximize that debut and that interest. But for this one, like, it's not like they sold this out, but th this was a very, very strong number. So I, I guess you can go in, in terms of like, y you can argue either way. Um, had right. they hammered this home harder last week, would they have moved that many more remains to be seen, but I think they would be happy with the end result here. Also uh, not on the broadcast, but at the TD garden, uh, Taro ok Okada of stardom was at the show uh, as was Mina Shirakawa who worked the uh, ROH taping. So that would seem to suggest like a more in-depth relationship with stardom moving forward. Uh, Tony Khan did, uh, did take a photo with Okada. So we had a, we had the double Okadas under one roof. And would, I guess, continue to suggest maybe um, one of the reasons why you haven't seen more stardom interaction with AEW might be because of Rossi Ogawa. Um, this, I mean, felt like almost a direct shot at, at um, perhaps his uh, tweets at Rossi Ogawa earlier in the year. Um, so, yeah, we'll see what sort of stardom interaction will continue with AEW. The show began with Renee in the backstage area teeing up the show when a Mercedes pulled up car door opens and then they cut to the arena and the the just whole crowd just oh as they were going to let this this wait and but they wouldn't have to wait for long because the music plays and out comes mercedes monet the ceo and she got this huge reaction the her her theme is just tailored for this chant that is going to be uh synonymous with her entrances i think her her theme actually includes the chant it I includes mean. the chant because when she got into the ring it's like there's a part where it's just chanting yeah. as well but it's going to be just like uh just monkey see monkey do where oh. the crowd is just going to play along and chant with this this card would have done it either way. Yeah. And this is a different song from what she was using earlier um, as Mercedes Bonet. This one is the one they she, I believe, debuted here. Um, and uh, I think it's really strong. It's really good. It uh, includes a sample of, of Dvorak's um, Symphony Number no. 9, like the same theme that Walter used to use. Um, and I think it just, it really works. Well, she tells Boston she's home. She thanks them for having her back the past two years, giving her the courage and strength to be here. We're going to create more moments. Wrestling saved her life. She mentions Eddie Guerrero. She led a women's evolution, was the first woman to headline a pay-per-view in this very arena, and talks about dropping out of school when she was 13 to take care of her brother and then going to chaotic wrestling to start her career and says, I need to be here in AEW. I want to be here. And this is the only place where the revolution can be global. And I'm going to make that happen. And then goes on to state that Riho and Willow are the main event tonight. And she has unfinished business with Willow, hearkening back to where she got injured last year. Uh, but tonight, uh, Mercedes Monet is all elite as the graphic appears on the screen. And this right. was the first 15 minutes of the show. And she got a tremendous reaction here in boston and how did you think it came across i thought overall good you know um i don't think it's controversial to say that um as talented as mercedes monet is you can definitely argue maybe her promo is her weakest part of her game so i was asking the question of how satisfying this segment would be when the entire appearance is pretty much centered around her coming out and delivering an opening promo uh, when the bar has been set so high by a cm punk you know in the first dance but i thought she did great overall you know she said it very confident didn't stumble with any of her lines um i think the new song is great her outfits as always are amazing she looked like she was worthy of all of this hype and the crowd really treated her like she was the biggest star in the world tonight so in terms of promo content i don't know if she said so much that was that sub substantive like or even all that memorable you know this was largely a, a thank you boston thank you thank there was a lot of promo. thank yous in this message as there should be you know but um got into a bit of a personal history here dropping out of school to take care of her brother wrestling for a local indie i personally would have liked to hear her target and personally mention a few more members of this roster i'm glad that she made the space to you know directly um talk about the feud with willow and, and unfinished business but i think like this was such a big spotlight on mercedes tonight with so many potentially new eyeballs watching i think her simply mentioning a few more other names out there like a you know serena deeb tony storm um who, who even julia hart you know what what have you would have 
really made the division feel that much more fuller uh, and would have given you new direct sort of um, future matches for, for her down the road. I thought the like the main thing of this segment was she felt like a top level star um, throughout the show. And in this first segment, the audience took to her. It ended up being a really big crowd. And I think that was the key. Like it feels as though there's a major star that has landed here in the company. And they obviously were treating this show as not just the arrival of Mercedes Monet, but a statement to some of the critics of the way the women have been handled here, just by the statement of putting Willow and Riho into the main event that I don't think even with Mercedes coming in, I don't think anyone would have assumed that that would have been the main event on the, the show, but they, they are telling you that the women can go on last year. And you no, know, the fact that Mercedes is here, they are going to be probably putting more emphasis on some of these programs. Well, we'll, we'll have to see. Right. Um, but yeah, I would think so too. You know, she's immediately coming in as the biggest star in the entire division. One of the biggest stars in the entire company. Um, I don't expect anything involving a Sasha Banks, sorry, Mercedes Monet match being held at 9 30 PM, even builds towards her opponents might not necessarily be a nine 30 segment anymore. She will get the main event or at least opening segment in, in many weeks. And you know, um, it's, it's not just the women's championship that might have, you know, that, that prime spot. Now it's a Mercedes match with or without the championship that could be there. I also found it interesting how, um, her line was, uh, this is the only place where, uh, um, the women's revolution can be global. Which would seem to hint at her continued association with a company like Stardom and wrestling in Japan or elsewhere, even. I think that that was the translation of like the open borders that AEW has that mm -hmm. she can work in a, a Stardom and go other places and work with talent, regardless of company, as well. So you don't expect a um, another tooth and nail match involving a Britt Baker with Mercedes Monet, do you? A tooth and nail. Remind me what that was. Was that, that the was, big swole? Yeah. In the, in the dentist and, office, well, uh, uh, we're kind of past the era of, of cinematic matches right now, but um, you'd never say never. No, Renee is backstage with Samoa Joe, stating tonight feels like money, and he says Wardlow has been sent by lesser men for crimes he didn't commit, but he doesn't forget the last time they met, which was Revolution last year when Wardlow beat him for the TNT title, and says I don't lose championships at the Garden. Do you know what that was in reference to? Um. I, d I don't associate too much about Samoa Joe in this particular TD Garden, but I'm sure someone will bring up his uh, his past history in, in the building. It's not mm -hmm. one that I say would say is synonymous with Samoa Joe title defenses, but mm -hmm. there must be some reason to that line. Then we had story time with Adam Cole, complete with illustration in the book, and a story about a warrior called Wardlow who was deceived and lied to and guarded by an evil man slash devil, as they show MJF on the screen. He said that Wardlow slayed many beasts, but he longed for a kingdom that hated the evil man as much as he did and ready to vanquish the champion and fulfill his destiny. And he heroically slayed the beast. And then the precious gold was captured. The prophecy fulfilled. The kingdom became whole. The end. Right. Um, I mean, good production for a segment like this. And, and it's something that's very different from your typical video recap or, or backstage interview segment. Um, I thought it was kind of cheesy um, and not necessarily something I I feel is like fitting of, of the Undisputed Kingdom and what they've set out. But honestly, I don't I don't even know if that's true because I don't really know what's fitting of the Undisputed Kingdom at this point. But is it this sort of story time type of thing? Well, I, my, my biggest uh, gripe was the fact that th this book was way longer than I think this story was. Well, didn't you see the size of the font? You know, this is like one of those children's books, you know, heart. Yeah. Heart, like. Maybe this is like those uh the, the five minute bluey book. Yeah. Familiar. Yeah. It's like the very thick sort of pages that you could just clean easily. Could be. Well, that was that. Uh, I mean, maybe worth noting, like the, the visual of MJF and at least being shown mm -hmm. in this and maybe a, a, a tease for what is to come. It's down been the road. suggested that like, you know, Dynasty might be a reference to um, his former stable uh, in MLW, I believe so we are kind of coming up on a potential return date for max aren't we okay. i guess it depends on the status of his injury which we was he gonna uh, get get together with uh richard holiday and uh, mm. uh can't probably can't get alex hammerstone um, or maybe no, they can get a date pass for him <laughs> samoa joe and wardlow is uh kicking off the in-ring portion and wardlow got a fair amount of heat here he tore up a fan sign um 
I don't know what the state of this guy's knees are in, but he looked like Kazushi Sakuraba with the way his knees were all taped up here. He has a brace on one of them. I mean, th this dude looks like he's just being kept together by, you know, mo modern technology. So as a natural for, for the man with the, uh, the taped up mummy looking knees, he does a whisper in the wind off the top. And then they're in the picture in picture. It looked like they bumped heads together and both seemed to be a bit off from this. And Wardlow was like bleeding from the mouth. Wardlow doesn't fall for the walk-off. One of the first guys who didn't uh, fall for this thing. Mm -hmm. uh, and then hits a shoulder tackle off the buckle. And then Wardlow's knee is hurt. And this was a completely believable spot. Um, but he was just faking it to gouge the eye of Joe. And he hits the knee strike off the turnbuckle that no one has kicked out from until now when Joe kicks out. So then Wardlow misses a swanton and we get punches in the corner by Joe into a power bomb from Wardlow. The straps come down. And as he goes for the power bomb symphony, he, Joe stops him, gets to the back. Coquina bounces him off the rope and down goes Wardlow in the Coquina clutch. And he passes out at 11 minutes and nine seconds. I thought the match was all right. Um, it's clear like Wardlow is good. I would even say like certainly uh, on the microphone um, several weeks ago, he definitely showed a glimpse in this particular build to this match that I I hadn't seen before. But when it kind of comes down to it and we, we get to this match and now we're after the match, it, it's just kind of he's just kind of forgettable, unfortunately. You know, um, I didn't find the match all that memorable. It just kind of came and went. And right after he lost, um, Wardlow just kind of feels like he's just gone back into the mid card immediately and out of sight. I could see like if, if MJF is like in some part of the foreseeable future coming back, like it would make sense that Wardlow is positioned with MJF uh, ahead of Adam Cole. But again, we're, we're looking at a possibility where again, Wardlow is kind of the, the appetizer for the main course, which is Adam Cole. So, mm. I mean, it's just frequent that Wardlow is kind of in these situations where, Listen, this is a super deep roster, and I can't necessarily make the argument that you, know, you can't push every guy. And is Wardlow in your like top ten of, of of guys that you want to elevate to the next level? Like maybe he is, but there's a lot of depth, and there needs to be the guys that are just television programs for certain champions or or top acts. Right. Yeah. Um, again, like he's. <laughs> He seems like he has he has all the raw material that you would want of somebody in a prominent position, but he's just to me yet to find some that thing that's special about him. You know the way that um, I think several like a swerve has. You know, for instance, um, uh, there's just there's just really nothing that stands out, and um, I hope he finds it because I, I wonder how many more chances he'll get at at this level of of uh, you know push. You're advocating for a break and enter. It worked for Swerve, yeah. Speaking of, Swerve is fighting off security to try to get to the ring. He's got his chain, but Joe just bails out. And then in the... Uh, one of the best moments of the entire show, one of the security guards is just laid out on the ramp, and he's just selling, like, laying there at the edge, and Joe just calmly walks up the ramp, sees this fool laying there. This is uh, Northeast wrestler Bryce Donovan. And he just gingerly swats him with his foot. And this poor guy rolls off the ramp to the floor. I rewound this three times and watched it and was so happy when I went online and everyone fixated on this moment like I did. It was a top, a top moment on dynamite for me. I get amused by very simple things. And this was one of them. Well, I, I thank goodness you had the ability to rewind. So you can Thankfully, on it. AEW Plus, it gives me that option. Marvez is with the Elite who are coming down a escalator and they are insisting that they call Kazuchika Okada by his full name. They explain why he is here with them because of 14 years of friendship where Okada helped them when they were at their lowest. And then they joke that there's 14 million other reasons why Okada joined us. Thanks mm -hmm. Tokyo sports and Okada warns the death triangle. He's coming for them and then tells Alex Marvez to wish Matthew a happy birthday, which he does. And Okada says, no, sing him a happy birthday. And they thankfully uh, cut to break before Alex Marvez could get deep into the song. Um, but he, <laughs> he did begin. I, I yeah I love that they're very slowly obviously you know um Okada's association with the Bucks I think brings a lot of positives one of which is being able to put training wheels on him to get him more and more comfortable um 
exposing his personality and speaking on the microphone to an American television uh, sort of uh, product. And um, already they're giving him a little bit of mic time. And with what little he had, I thought he was tremendous in delivering here. The way he said, sing it, I thought was hilarious. You had a really good little glimpse of like Okada's sort of like mischievous charisma here that I don't think was ever fully realized, um, at least in attempts I've seen of him trying to play heel um, at times in New Japan Pro Wrestling. Yeah, I, I'm enjoying this introduction of Okada, the alliance with the Bucks. I, I think like this many weeks in, it's been a very smooth transition for Okada, I think is putting it mildly. Mm -hmm. So it's Okada and the Young Bucks against Eddie Kingston, Pac, and Penta. Um, it, it's fine. I was thinking the exact same thing as one of the announcers were just like, look at the amount of talent in this match. Just yeah. This was wild that you're just watching like, like there's a moment in this match where Okada and Pac get tagged in and they they kind of kept them separate. It was just like these two ships passing in the night. But there's a match you could just do one week and yeah. it would be like, how intriguing would an Okada Pac match be for 15 minutes on a collision? Like this could have headline. I mean, this could headline, honestly. Now could it headline any pay-per-view? I mean, I, I guess I'm not really sure, but like this could have certainly headline all in. You remember that first all in? Yeah. I mean, I mean like, look at, dude, Okada and Kingston that we were talking about for the pay-per-view. It's not even going to be the main event of the TV next week, probably. I know, I know, so, yeah. Uh, it does tell you the uh, the the depth that they have. It's uh, It was quite something. And this was Pac's first match since July. And uh, they also, we should note, they've added this uh, deal where Matt flips a coin to tee up Okada's uh, theme. So that's uh, something new that they have added. Yeah, the, tonight was a lot better time than um, the first time they tried it on Saturday. But very cool. Very neat. Kingston and Okada are trading chops. Taz compares Okada's dropkick to that of Hardcore Hollies. And Excalibur just basically says, yeah, Okada's is better. And then as we go to picture in picture, it's like Taz is just talking about you know, I've, I've been here in Boston. Those Savoldis still owe me money. And he just starts going off on like the Savoldis. Uh, the like Angelo and Mario Savoldi, they were uh, run, like uh, running uh, an independent ICW group that uh, got immortalized on a, a classic wrestling on the Fight Network that was hosted by one uh, John Paul. Uh, <laughs> Is that right? Wow. From, uh, 15 years ago. <laughs> yes. Uh, so they work on Eddie Kingston. And uh, this is throughout the break until uh, Penta gets the tag. And uh, Penta here just did this fire up on Okada and the Bucks, including a wheelbarrow roll through on Okada into a double DDT to the Bucks. Penta and Pac do stereo dives to the floor. And then it's Pac with the springboard 450 onto Nick. Penta's in with a destroyer on Matt. And then Nick super kicks Penta and has the uh, his actual like belt from around his waist uh, wrapped around his fist but can't use it nick kicks kingston low behind referee rick knox's back and he turns into the rainmaker and okada pins kingston in 12 minutes and 39 seconds and he's holding up the continental crown and no this is not happening at dynasty they announce it for next week in toronto kazuchika okada challenging eddie kingston for the continental crown very surprised by that match announcement and very pleasantly surprised, of course, because uh, John and I will be attending that show. But um, I I thought for sure it would be Dynasty that they would saving be saving something like that for. Um, but I guess they want to sell tickets. And this is a, a really major hook on top of, of course, you know, Adam Copeland versus Christian Cage. I thought the match tonight was was a very good Bucks death triangle pace of match with, uh, you know, specific focus being placed on Eddie versus Okada. Uh, the, the match did a great job of making you want to see Eddie finally get his hands on Okada in a one on one situation. And again, Okada playing a real dick here, avoiding it at all costs. I, again, I thought it was a really good showcase of Okada's like cocky heel charisma here. So it, it's already really freshened up Okada for me, this whole thing. The video for Christian Cage and Adam Copeland, neither of whom were on the show tonight. Shivani brings out Will Ospreay, who, I mean, this guy is a superstar. Mm -hmm. He came out, this place went wild. I mean, he's just got charisma just brimming out of him. It's huge. The whole crowd starts chanting bruv, and he's explaining that all of his career, he has wanted to emulate Brian Danielson and says, I always Danielson is a guy who always left it in the ring. And he goes back and brings up forbidden door Two and the tiger driver 91 spot that he delivered to Kenny Omega. And after the match, Brian Danielson asking, 
was it worth it? And Osprey says, yeah, bruv, it was worth it. Mm -hmm. This was at the press conference after the match. Yes. So my question to you is that if this ends up uh, being a match of the year contender after April 21st, how much credit do I get for this match coming together based on my question? I got <laughs> this right. answer out of Brian Danielson. All right. <laughs> you get at least one star. Okay. It goes to John for, for the backstory here. You get as much credit as Dave gets for um all in the initial one. It's comparable. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. He says that this match means more to him and people around the world. And there's a saying that goes around and I know Tony Khan knows it and all these people know it. It's called restore the feeling. Bruv, I am the feeling. And this shirt will be out by next week. I am the feeling. I am the feeling. Would you wear that? Uh, no, I, but I, I would not wear it. I would. Why not? Sure. He's reminding people of what AEW is. And this match pits the best wrestler in the world against the best wrestler of the 21st century. Only one man walks out. It's your life or it's mine. And I don't plan on dying, bruv. I'm Will Ospreay. And I am on another level. And uh, dude, this guy was fantastic in this segment. I mean, for yeah. any concerns about this guy um, of the personality side, I mean, his charisma has been exponentially growing for some time. This is not like this is just a switch he has flipped, but it is, I, I don't mean to play on words here. It is at another level since he has come to North America and he just has connected in such a way. Like this guy just felt like, this is the biggest star on this roster uh, tonight. Yeah. So I haven't really been watching New Japan as closely over the past several years. Um, but like I have had seen glimpses of him, you know, primarily, I think it was the Wrestle Kingdom um, Omega match or the press or conference. Did the press conference. And that's when I really took notice. And I think a lot of people really did take notice of just how much better he's gotten on the microphone. But still, even though you hear a guy like, you know, cut a, a promo like that at a press conference without like the time constraints of television, really without any sort of constraints whatsoever, that's a very different beast from a television promo. So there were still questions about how well he would translate to a TV product in front of like this type of audience with time cues, with all that. The guy is amazing at it. You know, he's only spent a few weeks as a permanent fixture on an American television product, and you can already slot him right up there as one of the stronger promos in this entire company. Like, I don't know who this guy's been working with. I don't know what his practice has been like to get him to this level, but like there's a smoothness, there's a charisma, there's a sort of like naturalness of all of this that I, I like. Remember when we just watched that documentary not all that long ago on Osprey? It's like a different person. What documentary? The Will Ospreay documentary. We did this like a year ago. It's not. Oh, okay. Man, I, don't, I don't remember anything. And it's just <laughs> you watch ago. and you discard I'm immediately. Sorry. Yes. We once reviewed the Will Ospreay documentary yeah. on a rewind away. How many people in the performance center? And I, I don't even mean, mean to make this a WWE, AEW thing, but I'm saying people that are put through like a, 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 a location where you're, you're taught every single day, taking classes on how to cut a promo. How many people sound this good at this level? And, and maybe it's not a fair comparison because Ospreay, you know he's he's done it all around the world he cuts promos probably at the end of like every single independent wrestling match i'd say but the best still. promo at the moment in nxt is trick williams and i thought this was better yeah um so i i again i i still get amazed every time i hear more of him speaking into the microphone this will osprey yeah it's a fantastic segment here just building up this match and like the ideas like here are two of the best wrestlers ever that are gonna have a match on the pay-per-view and that's kind of all all you need to build this one up they went through the lineup for Rampage, which is being taped as we speak, with the best friends against Dark Order, Roderick Strong, Matt Taven, and Mike Bennett against Top Flight and Action Andretti, Tony Storm and Mariah May in action, and they will release the brackets for the tag title tournament, these mysterious brackets for this tournament that's beginning very quickly. Yeah, we we, we can assume a handful of teams, but we, we'll, we'll wait to see what they are. Deanna Perazzo did a promo backstage reminding everyone that she tapped out Tony Storm. This is not over and she can find a partner to face Tony and Mariah in Toronto next week. And she might show up at Rampage uh, suggesting that uh, you watch the sh watch the shoe because it's going straight up your ass. That, that wouldn't be fun. Man, like shoes and yeet. I mean, these are um, a lot of uh, <laughs> a lot of things in orifices. Yeah, so. Uh, who do you any predictions on who the uh, partner might be? Um, 
No. No prediction. <laughs> could be I don't anybody, know. Really. I mean, yeah. it's it's in Canada. You could you could go with, with a baby face and, and go with Taya. I, I think Tony Storm's gonna be a pretty big baby face next week. I think so too. Mm -hmm. Jay White, along with the guns uh in his corner, taking on Darby Allen. It was kind of interesting the fact that they didn't lean on any of that kind of darker stuff last week about this could be his last match ever. I just mm. don't think they really wanted to lean on the idea that this guy is going to do something that doesn't have a 0% chance of success. And because yep. they didn't raise that at all in the the post promo build up for this and not at all once on the commentary. It was just on him selling the effects from revolution, which I wonder how much selling there was. I mean, there was selling, but I'm sure it was um, aided by real pain. Too. Yeah. I mean, could be a number of factors. Like, you know, it could be simply subject. It's commanders. really goddamn dark. That, yeah. That would probably not age well. If God forbid something terrible happened and we go back and listen to this. And I'm sure they're already facing criticisms of like, maybe, um, I don't know, uh, trying to promote this particular match as, Hey, like, Darby Allen could die, and so this could be his last match. So probably the, 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 like a, a route that we all accept. So Darby is just a mess here. They're explaining like his ribs and back and hip are all screwed up. And it's Jay just doing basic side headlock takeovers. And Darby is just, he is maximizing every basic move uh, for all it's worth of the pain that he is going through. And Jay is lighting him up with chops. I'm going to open your chest up, he's telling him. And finally, Darby, avoiding a pair of Blade Runners, hits the flip over stunner and then applies the Last Supper. But Jay kicks out of that and drops him with a Uranagi. And then a vertical suplex is countered with Darby hitting the Scorpion Death Drop as Jay gets his foot on the bottom rope. And Jay is laying on the edge of the apron. And Darby climbs up and he hits the most violent looking coffin drop attempt I think I've seen this dude ever do as Jay gets out of the way and Darby comes at such a speed and lands at the ugliest of angles on the edge. And I am convinced that Taz thought that this man is paralyzed. He was frightened for this guy and it looked just sick. If I was literally rooting, let's just do the count out finish. This is the most believable count out possible. And at the count of nine, he pops up into the ring, right into the Blade Runner, which I really do like those spots when you mm -hmm. beat the count out, but you run into a trap and he's pinned in 12, 17. Um, dude, this coffin drop was just, it just, it was insane. And I, I feel like we use that word over and over again. Yeah, I feel like we have at least one of those reactions for almost every single Darby Allen match um, these days. And um, he went down so hard on mm -hmm. this. It, like, I just can't believe how much speed he picked up on this yeah. coffin drop that we've seen him do many times to the edge. But this just felt like it was um, worse than usual. Yeah, yeah, I, I feel. Um, oh, man, I, I, I really do wonder how how these matches will age like if we have to go back and revisit them 10 years from now i mean i think we all nobody is sit telling darby to um hey like this is good this is fine like i think everybody watching darby is saying you got to slow down because we know what happens to a jeff hardy we know what happens to a mcfoley you know um working a style like this and I, I obviously you can't stop it you know this guy chooses to do this um for whatever reason and um it creates these incredible reactions out of us and it makes his matches pretty goddamn like captivating, you know, um, he's insane, uh, great selling here, or if it was maybe selling at all. Um, but yeah, very captivating wrestling match. And it was nice to see Jay white work heel again here. White offers his hand to Darby, but then turns it into the gun motion and sets Colton and Austin to attack him. And they wrap a chair around his ankle and they're about to bash it with stings bat that Darby is now carrying when the acclaimed run out with daddy asked to stop them and ask them what they're doing here. And they're, they're apologizing. And then white attacks daddy ass with the chair, the acclaimed come back. They're beaten down by the guns. They're taken out with belt shots and a blade runner on Billy. And then they shattered Darby's ankle. So this looks to be the end of the bang, bang scissor gang. Yeah. Uh, which, I mean, I think we all expected the turn eventually and the breakup eventually, but I wasn't exactly sure which direction 
each would go. I thought there would be actually a really good chance that um, the Acclaim would would turn heel. And the Bang Bang Scissor Gang, who I think have been kind of embraced as baby faces as of late, would continue their baby face run. Um, all the stuff with like Max 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 Caster uh, flubbing his his rap, I, I, which he insists uh, he he has never screwed up a rap. So right, that's his, yeah. Uh, well, all of Max Caster's social media sort of behavior recently, I for me like almost felt like he was um already turning heel online so i thought that's the direction they were going but no this seems to be a bit of a you know we're going back to the status quo here of the bang bang sorry uh what, what are they called bullet club gold being heels against a, a baby face acclaim none of the members are defecting from one team to another um and i guess using this as an excuse to for darby not to be around either next up was lion hook chris jericho and hook against the gates of agony and uh, Jericho worked a good portion of this match uh, uh, at the beginning. Uh, Toa knocks both men off the apron to the floor. And he's uh, Jericho's hit with a pounce. And then finally is able to make his way to tag Hook, who comes in and he suplexes Khan, tries to lift up Toa, but he can't. So at one point, Jericho comes to the top rope and he's going for a double sledge, but Toa is walking away. So Jericho, not wanting to just stand up there and be like left there hanging, leaps for this double sledge and just like with his hands makes his way. Like Toa had no idea. Um, I think that he was to be in position here for this uh, this spot off the top by Jericho. Hook then lifts up Toa for the German after bouncing him off the rope. And there's a counter. He gets the red rum onto Khan, shoves him into Toa. And then he is fighting to get this red rum applied as Jericho takes the legs of Toa and applies the walls while Hook is still on top of his back and the camera just goes on to Jericho because I don't think this red rum was in at all. And then Jericho lets go of his submission to drop kick Toa and Khan taps out at eight minutes and 43 seconds. Um, bit, bit of workshopping to do with this uh, with, with, with this finisher, but uh, what did you think of uh, the debut of Lion Hook? Um, I thought it was okay. I, I, I mean, I didn't think there was really anything all that offensive about it, but now is it necessarily a tag team that I'm craving to see more of? You know, is it a a, a stylistic sort of match that I think is is that interesting? Um, is it a story that I think is that deep and that interesting? Not yet to maybe all of those questions. Um, but I wonder if they're going to tag again because we're already going to the match next week. We are, but it does seem the way they're setting it up is that it's going to be like the mutual respect deal, kind of like what they did with Jericho and Sammy when they had their match. I'm expecting they're in this tag tournament, even though it doesn't make a whole lot of a, uh, they're one to know, but the rankings have also been a uh, severely downplayed of late as well. You don't get a name like line hook unless you're, you're planning yeah. on merchandising it. So as we mentioned, Kyle O'Reilly is back. It's his first match back since the, uh, the neck fusion surgery on Saturday against Brian Keith. And they're in Ottawa in Canada. So Renee interviews Kyle who he is definitely running with this t-shirt gag. Is it a gag? I mean, I think it's just, the well, I, I don't know. It's um. at least he got a clean shirt. It was, say. it was a clean white shirt. He says there was a period during this injury. He could not even lift up his daughter, but his neck got better. And he's questioning if he can still hang in the most competitive roster in the history of the sport, but he has his sights set on Brian Keith in his home country. And then in walks Roderick strong, Matt Taven and Mike Bennett. And they say they love Kyle. And if he wants to do this on his own, they wish him the best. And they all shake hands. And Kyle is left to reflect. And I'm going to do this on my own. Yeah. Yeah. Mm hmm. <laughs> is interesting. Interesting Kyle O'Reilly impression. Um, We'll see where the story goes with, you know, the Undisputed Kingdom. Obviously, he's still very much attached to them. Um, Doesn't feel big right now and it's hard like if you're kyle o'reilly coming in right in between kazuchika okada will osprey and mercedes monet like good luck catching any sort of i don't know um attention when you're that guy it, like collision in a, in a backstage interview with renee is pretty much all you get uh so he's gonna have to make sort of um he those headlines with incredible in-ring performances so we'll see if he can do that against brian keith this, this is a guy that like 2017 2018 like this was a guy regarded as like Kushida easy, told easy top 10 wrestler in the world Kushida um, I don't know if he still does but said Kyle is the best wrestler in the world yeah 
Then they showed a video for Riho and Willow Nightingale, some of their highlights, including Riho becoming the first AEW women's champion, Willow beating Mercedes last year, and then also winning the Owen Hart tournament. And Mercedes came up introducing herself to Riho. Renee interviews Jericho and Hook, and uh, Jericho did not seem too impressed when he heard the name Lion Hook, which I think he was hearing for the first time in this segment. Says that Hook is a I future. Thought you world... He came up with it. Are you kidding me? Um, uh, perhaps. He probably has it trademarked already. He says Hook is a future world champion. He needs to know more about Hook. He needs to stand across from the ring and challenges him for next week in Toronto. And uh, Hook responded, let's do it. And so we have another Hook for Toronto. Uh, th that, that is correct, yes. So that is the lineup for Toronto. Cage and Adam Copeland in the I Quit match for the TNT title. Kingston and Okada for the Continental Crown. Hook against Jericho. Mercedes Monet will appear and this tag match with Deanna and a partner against Tony Storm and Mariah May. And that kind of feels like the whole card for next week, because you would think the uh, the top two matches are going to get significant time, especially the I Quit match. And I would say Kingston and Okada, if you're doing a, I'm pretty sure you're getting a like a finish in this match. You think so? I mean, it, it, there could there could be a non finish that leads to the pay per view, of course. Um, but I mean, I, I, it looks like a hell of a card, you know, just with the uh, cage match and sorry, the the cage and Copeland match, and also Okada versus Eddie Kingston alone. That that sounds pretty big to me. Did you do a time limit with Kingston and Okada? Yeah, definitely. Now, I, when was the last one they just did? Uh, they did at, at FTR against uh, Claudio and yes. uh, Moxley. Right, right. Uh, by the way, uh, what, what, do you have um uh, current ticket sales for that show? Next Toronto week? is uh around. I want to say like. 4100 or so maybe a little above that it's there, there's plenty of tickets left for oh, the, yeah. the setup at at uh, coca-cola coliseum they've got mm. um let's look here the last update from wrestle ticks was just over 4200 so uh, we'll see yeah 4700 now as of uh an hour ago from wrestle okay. okay well there so you go. i mean we'll see if like you know okada eddie means anything um and maybe mercedes monet mm -hmm. they said mercedes monet will speak now does that mean she'll yeah. appear live or is it pre taped um yeah they said she would appear um yeah i think that would be um well they said she'll did she say, did say did they say appear or, or speak or whatever somebody correct us in the chat room okay well one, one or the other and then we had the main event between willow nightingale and Riho. statlander and stokely came out but then they just walked right to the back so that was kind of part of the story here stokely was not there to screw things up so Willow is working on her and then a head scissors sends her onto the middle rope and she takes a tiger faint kick from Rio. And when Rio would get on offense, man, they really picked up with the, this crowd who was just like, they just loved Rio here. And the two were really hard. And they, uh, we see Rio with a double stomp off the apron and then a dragon suplex onto the edge of the apron by Rio to Willow Nightingale, which looked nuts. Rio then hits another double stomp in the ring for a near fall. Willow comes back with a lariat, and then there's a roll through on a jackknife cover into the gut wrench position and turns it to the babe with the power bomb. And Willow pins her in nine minutes and 19 seconds. They go to hug after. Um, I thought this was a well wrestled match. The audience was with it and and took it as the, the main event. I thought this was a real positive for um, putting these two at the end. It's not as though this was some big built up match. I mean, this was just a like Willow's in her own program. Riho is sort of the woman's wrestler. You can plug into any match and work with it. But I like th this was not built up and I thought they did very well for the placement. I think the story was simply um, Willow following up on Statlander's match with Riho, like as part of the whole sort of, sort of Stokely, um, you know, thing, um, which wasn't really, I think talked about that much in this particular match. I mean, this match suddenly became relevant because Mercedes Monet was specifically targeting Willow, um, talking about, you know, um, Willow being the last person who beat her. So that almost kind of took over as the new storyline for the match. And I don't know if it necessarily had any sort of anything to do with like the, the crowd's heightened reaction to the match, or if it was just that the match was really good because it was, you know, it's a really tough slot for two people who aren't typically even like on dynamite to, um, be in the main event and to attract this level of attention. So it just kind of told you how entertaining the match was. Uh, man, Riho was excellent here with her offense on uh, the bigger Willow Nightingale. And I thought um, they like, 
man, they put a lot into to this one, taking a lot of big bumps from Willow, especially, and uh, it they really captured the crowd. By the way, um, the graphic specifically said, "We'll hear from Mercedes Bonet." So, I uh, whatever that means, like I'm, I'm sure. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll hear from is probably um, not a uh, physical appearance. Well, we we can't confirm. You know, maybe uh, maybe she'll be on the lap. Maybe she, maybe she'll Skype in. And it's possible. Second week, I would have her show up. You know, I would too. Um, I think that that would be Boston uh, and Toronto aren't that far away. So they hug after the match. The lights go out and Julia Hart appears. Uh, but it's a, a foil as Sky Blue comes from behind, chop blocking uh, the knee of Willow Nightingale. And all I could think of, man, I hope Julia Hart saw which knee she chop blocked. <laughs> And they double team Willow and the crowd knows they're chanting CEO and they go for a belt shot when Mercedes returns and Dex Sky Blue on the ramp enters the ring with Julia Hart and hits her with the moneymaker and drills Julia Hart. Willow raises her arm and then leaves leaves the stage for Mercedes who just uh, leaves in the leaves in the ring and is uh, ringside and they go off the air with uh, Mercedes Monet, the big star that has arrived. The moneymaker looked good on Julia Hart, you know, which um, I still think back to that that one Kyrie took. Because uh, this girl, she just like rolled her onto the mat. She wasn't trying to get that knee strike in at the end. Am I remembering this right? I don't uh, think the other one, I don't think it's ever meant to be a knee strike. I think it's meant to be like a DDT of sorts. Uh, then, then I'm misremembering the, uh, the we, we only got to see it a few times. Before. Yeah. And, and I'm particular, uh, I'm thinking about the Kyrie one at Wrestle Kingdom, which just mm-hmm. didn't really look good at all. Uh, but this one looked very good from Julia Hart and, uh, you know, immediately kind of makes Willow at least relevant. Now, um, will she continue to be relevant after Mercedes just beats her? Um, we'll see. But I, I'm at the very least happy that Willow is at least getting this level of attention building off of that, that match in uh, New Japan. What did you think of the show overall? I mean, it was really centered around Mercedes. I think they delivered on what they promised or at least teased, you know? I'll say, like, I feel like um, it's it was a pretty by-the-numbers introduction of Mercedes. Like, there was really nothing that surprising. Even, like, this final segment here with Willow kind of went about as typical as a pro wrestling segment might be with somebody that's kind of brand new. But they d- they want the surprise they considered was just simply having Mercedes Bonet being around. And I mean, they delivered that everything else. Like I, I really like the Okada continued interaction with the elite. I thought that match was, was really, really strong. Uh, Darby and Jay white was also a really strong match and um, good luck to that man as he's about to climb Mount Everest. And you know, the announcement of Ed King- Kingston versus Okada, um, pretty massive to me joe versus uh, uh, wardlow kind of there really really not nothing that special in my opinion all right uh if you have super chats you are welcome to submit them we're going to go to forum.postwrestling.com as we take questions and feedback yeah we do have some super chats to get to but before we do that i wanted to let everybody know about a sale or at least a contest that's going on over at chop-tees.com slash post wrestling we uh, or Dickie, I should say, at Chop Tees is giving away $350 worth of merchandise from Chop-Tees.com. $350 worth of tees, hats, hoodies across any merch they carry. So you can get some Poison Rana merch. You can get some Karen Peterson Empress merch or even Kings of Sport merch and especially Post Wrestling merch. Head over to Twitter, follow at Chopped underscore Tees and retweet their pinned tweet about the giveaway and you are entered to win $350 dollars in merch the prize value john is in u.s dollars talk mm. about talk about big business talk about money okay for us canadians that's almost 500 bucks when you're talking 350 us the competition ends at midnight on monday eastern standard time check the link on the pin tweet for terms and conditions and good luck all right check that all out the great work of one dicky bird all right um super chats super here chats yeah, let's go to uh, Rob McDonald, who says, happy birthday away. Looking forward to Dynamite and Tio. Thank you, Rob. Yeah, looking forward to seeing you there. Uh, we got a Jake from the Windy City who sends $20. Thank you, Jake. He says, happy, just a happy 40th birthday week donation here for the both of you. That's that's very kind. Thank you, Thank Jake. you, Jake. And then lastly, we got a Danny Mitchell who sends 10 bucks to say, I was at the show. Great atmosphere, but I need to highly recommend Commander versus Takeshita on Rampage. Second best match of the night after the main event. That sounds awesome. That's wild wow. to me. They didn't even promote that for Rampage. Wow, really? 
they, huh. uh, unless like when they they did like a specific part of just going through what's coming up on rampage and unless they snuck that in uh, in the commentary they never mentioned that and that to me would be worthy of at least equal billing to uh the dark order against the best friends i i missed the ra uh, rampage plug entirely so um i mean it's the type of match that i i you know they might as well just kind of announce online and and maybe get that sort of traction Cno says it wasn't promoted and i i definitely trust him so yeah all right Let's go to uh, Muggin here. Mercedes' debut was strong, and bookending the show with her is a testament to her star power. I almost expected her to jump Willow after the bell, but that's going to be kept on hold for now because going heel in her hometown wouldn't have been wise. The six-man was good, and Joe Wardlow was a solid match. AEW is gaining steam again. Let's go next to Andrew from Cape Breton, who says, Pretty good debut for Mercedes. It was good to have a massive star in the women's division, and hopefully this will put more focus on them. Even though the show was about Mercedes, someone who stood out to me was Will Ospreay. Will has been known as the best wrestler in the world, but I liked how he's starting to, de to develop into a great American-style babyface. He has his catchphrases, his catchy song that people sing, and great passion when he speaks. I do notice his eyes shift a lot, but I think he's getting used to cutting this style of promo. He's not polished, but I prefer that over a wooden delivery that can come with a scripted promo. Uh, did you notice the eyes, John? Oh, how could you not notice it? It was just uh, dominating the, the screen. No, I did not notice um, the man's eyes. I, I noticed the crowd going pretty nuts, though, for for that segment. So. He says, the show was great, but the low point was the Lion Hook slash Gates of Agony match. Jericho is in desperate need, need of a refresh, and I don't think pulling Hook into the Jericho verse is going to help matters. Also, I'm not a fan of them splitting the Continental title up. I guess they need something for the ROH show. Other than that, excellent show today. Yeah, that's um. So yeah, the they mentioned this is the first time that the Continental Crown will be defended on its own. So I I don't think that that necessarily telegraphs that they're flipping the title next week, but it certainly does give you the option of doing that and still preserving this Eddie Kingston headlining Supercard of Honor. That's right. Yeah, but no longer for the Triple Crown. Um, now, for the triple crown. now, does it also tell you perhaps uh, if Okada does win, if future, um, what, how limited his future interactions might be with New Japan at all? I, I, I don't expect Okada doing any New Japan in the in the near future. But I mean, just winning the Continental Crown. I mean, you could still do like the the winner take all at at Dynasty. I mean, there, there's ways around it if you wanted to do like a two match series. You could do the time limit. You could do one title change, and Eddie puts up his other belts. I mean, there's other mm -hmm. things you can do. But um, yeah, it's coming earlier than I think anyone ex expected for that match. Robbie from London, great show, was always a big fan of Mercedes, so was pumped to see her debut, and her star power just towers over everyone else. Part of me was hoping Britt Baker would return to oppose Monet, but a great segment and a fun book ending. I also expected her to attack Willow at the end. My fiancé even thought uh, Monet was being too nice, so it has to be coming, right? Here's hoping I get all these incoming stars in London at Collision in a couple of weeks. You'll find out um, at some point. Robbie, it's one thing is like with all these additions is that you you can't stack up all these TVs like look just tonight at like no BCC, um, no like you can go through the list like you just you just can't slot everybody even taking into account like the rampage hour. I mean, you're not going to necessarily um, stack that one, but I mean, there's only so many people you can fit on these shows and to to the last point that Andrew was was making, like I understand the the criticism some have of, um, you know, who gets like paired with Jericho, like the good and the bad of that. I'll tell you, without being involved with Jericho, I can't tell you Hook is doing a whole lot on the show. Um, mm -hmm. I think he is, you know, it just there's going to be people that are going to be on the back burners, and it's not an indictment of talents and skills, but we're talking just a. Kyle O'Reilly and Pac are back in the mix, okay? Yeah. And they're, like, that much down on the depth chart of the new additions. Yeah. Uh, let's also remember, was Sammy Guevara supposed to be in this position? You know, Good, good point. Yeah, he would have been. Yeah. Right, right. Hook is also the type of character, I mean, maybe kind of like Orange Cassidy was for um, before, maybe this um, TNT, title, or sorry, international run where he really needs a big, big personality to kind of carry him along through a lot of these segments and do the talking for for the their, their promos so um it's not it's certainly not the worst thing for him now is it the most interesting on the show i mean there are a lot of much more interesting things on the show right now we'll, we'll see if they can increase it next week steve grows weed says 
First hour was awesome. Great debut. Did they mention what CEO stands for in her case? Um, no, I, I can't imagine it stands for anything other than what it usually stands for. Not sure about the rest of the show because the Love is Blind reunion was tonight at 9 p.m. Had to see what was going on with Jeremy and Sarah Ann. Not to mention Clay's inability to commit. All right. Okay. Well, uh, he says, happy 40th birthday. Thank you, Steve Grossweed. Cody from Maine in Boston. Ten days after my trek to Greensboro, I made the drive down to Boston. I hope it sounded as loud on TV as it did for Mercedes' debut. Fantastic reaction and a great theme change with the unbelievably chantable CEO. As strong of a debut as you could have asked for with the entire show being built around her. Enjoyed the show overall with two of the new additions in Osprey and Okada being standouts. They really flexed the depth of the roster in that first hour. And while I wish Darby would get some rest, we know that isn't happening. No more live wrestling for me for a while. Although with the expanded pay-per-view schedule, I hope to be back in the garden later this year for another event well thank you for the live feedback uh cody that's yeah uh, you know to uh hell of a pay-per-view to go to and pretty lively show tonight in boston it's a lot of miles traveled for for this uh let's go to jay from colorado who says mercedes monet said something to the effect of i began my career at chaotic wrestling that's where i started my journey to become the greatest women's wrestler of all time if i can do it so can you as a 46-year-old man, how can I become the greatest women's wrestler of all time? Jay, don't don't let details get in the way of your dreams, okay? You can do anything you put your mind to. Have you even tried to go to chaotic wrestling? You don't know what, what's possible. That's it. And Annie has the last word here. Outstanding wrestling show. I'm not sure if there's any such thing as a 10 out of 10 episode, but big business would have come close if Jericho wasn't on. No, um, not not. Uh, mm. supporting the, the lion hook did you uh, also experiment. hear booze during the the jericho hook match announcement like in the back they didn't stand out to me but um they were audible to you they were in the background uh, I, i'll say so i mean i wonder I, I mean it's not like he's been booed like in his other appearances as of late no so. and he was back on commentary on rampage which is the first time in a, a long time that he's been on, hmm. on commentary for for that uh, as well you know one thing we we haven't talked about yet um and we'll we'll end off here is how much you read into the the reinsertion of Brock Lesnar onto the roster page in WWE? I mean, are you looking at this as you know how many others are of their kind of just testing the waters and seeing what is the reaction going to be? And I mean, I look at it that they are they're obviously not wanting to cut ties with Brock Lesnar, or they would have. And yeah. if not, then it's just it comes down to a matter of time before they're obviously going to try and use him. Is that how you read it? I think it's exactly that. I think whether or not they might admit it, I mean, in effect, it is testing the waters to see, to, to bring Brock Lesnar up into the conversation or at least um, something involving Brock Lesnar and to see how much conversation might be revolve around him, how much negativity might be around um, his inclusion. And our, you know, Vince McMahon, I think the story it, it, it is so big that even the mention of Vince, they want seem to want to distance themselves from is the average viewer. And more importantly, the sponsors, um, are they having those similar reactions to the mention of a Brock Lesnar? What, what's your sense? Um, I think it's um, I think Vince McMahon is completely radioactive and that's not going to be someone that they are <laughs> going to bat for. They're not waiting out Vince McMahon. I mean, they have, they have cut their ties and I, I think that's that um, with Brock. I think there's going to be a, like, I, I do not think they want to be revisiting this lawsuit when they don't have to be. And there's some ugly stuff in there involving Brock Lesnar. There are texts from uh, Brock Lesnar. It's, um, I'm surprised that they are trying to do this again. Like, is this a precursor to him being on TV next week? I don't think that is the case, but I mean, look at the cartwheels they had to perform on this video game to avoid Brock Lesnar and to downplay his involvement. Like I, I haven't played the game, but I understand he's either like not a playable character or it's like he was removed from the promotion. Like you don't have to go any further than that. There was active uh, changes to uh, Brock Lesnar's uh, role in, in the game. And, and here you are like just throwing him up onto the site. And what kind of a reaction is that going to elicit? Hmm. But let's also not get past the idea that we have seen a lot of stars that are, um, you know, that they 
yeah ultimately you ride out the clock and then you hope that you're enough of your fan base is indifferent to it and the fact is to a lot of your wrestling audience brock lesnar is still a star and they will weather whatever negativity there is hoping that that's only a minority of the audience and not overwhelming because if it's overwhelming and if there is sponsor pushback i would think this would be something that you would want to have all your key people sort of in alignment with i don't know mm -hmm. if you'd want to be your your sponsors are tuning in like everyone else and all of a sudden they're getting feedback and and messages about why are you involved with this individual that is on your that is on your partner's programming yeah my gut is that um when and if Brock Lesnar shows back up on WWE TV, I mean, I I think the reaction, at least in arena, will will be that of what it typically is, which is cheers and people acting as if this man is not really attached to any other controversy. Um, the reaction online, I think, will be very different. Now, is it going to be big enough to a level where TKO would want to pull back on it? Um, I mean, that's what they're trying to find out right now. My gut tells me they would be willing to commit to to having Brock. Is it worth it though? I guess is a bigger question. You know, like do it's, they need Brock Lesnar for this WrestleMania? No, no, they don't. Brock's not adding anything to this year's Mania. I mean, you're, um, and I wouldn't even necessarily. Um, well, I, I I can't even say like what what in their mind is their timetable because just the, the idea of taking this action would seem like an odd one. Um, How about Saudi? Like you know, all the other shows that might be coming up after this. Yeah, I listen, business is really hot and I don't think it's going to peak at WrestleMania. I mean, WrestleMania is going to be a big night for them. And um, I think I think this wave is going to go past mania for them. Like the idea that you could have the rock in for more than one match and just the idea of you have a new champion in, in Cody in theory, like they have a lot of irons in the fire that are clicking and I I don't think Brock is adding a whole ton to like Brock in and of itself is to me not going to be like this giant difference maker. I mean, mm. we go through these quarters and the spikes that like Cody is producing. Like Brock wasn't doing that. Like Brock yeah. is not this not working house shows. He's got a select schedule and business is on fire at the at, at this moment. Like if things were struggling and they've got this multi million dollar player sitting on the sidelines, yeah, I could I could understand some people at TKO stating, "Hey, we're paying this guy. Like let's let's just wait wait through the controversy. We we need him for business." Now how much of a concern? Time. How much of a concern is that point? The fact that we are paying this man and uh, assuming um, it's a lot of money. Then I'm you know. I'm sure it's a factor. I'm sure it's a factor. Like, hey, this is money going out, and we're not getting any return on this. And what are we against? Is just against the the public's appetite? And are we? Do, is this just like a soft test of things? Like, are they getting bombarded with criticism just over this this move? I would say it's been notable, but I wouldn't say there's been some fan revolt over just him showing up on the website. And mm -hmm. if there is, they can just say, "Hey, that it's indicative of nothing. It's a it's a clerical issue." Um, mm -hmm. you know, but it's, it's something to monitor and how he will be received when he comes back. So there you have it, everyone that you are all up to date. Thanks to everyone for tuning in for the super chats, for the feedback. We are here on Thursday, post wrestling cafe.com. It is the March edition of the ask away mailbag show again by Thursday morning. Get in your questions at forum.postwrestling.com or memo.fm slash post wrestling as we will be answering all of your questions, all topics, welcome. And then we're chatting with you Friday night after SmackDown in Memphis. Memphis, featuring The Rock. And programming note, next week here on Rewind of Dynamite, John and I will be in attendance right. at the show, and therefore we will not be going live right after the show. We will instead be doing Rewind of Dynamite on Thursday, 12 p.m. Eastern. That's right. Um, so yes, we will be live Thursday, noon Eastern, just for one week. Uh, but you will get our live experience uh, attending Dynamite from the Coca-Cola Coliseum. Mm -hmm. Yes. I'm debating wearing a mask to break the streak of uh, post representatives going to AEW shows and coming away with COVID. It might not be the, you know, um, I, I certainly would would not um, frown upon that decision. Yeah. Uh, who, who Who's kind of been hit so far? Me, me and Kate have both gotten COVID at AEW events yeah. that we have gone to. So I'm, I'm going to try and break that streak. All right. That's it for us. Uh, good night. Goodbye.
We'll speak with you on Thursday for the waiting birthday party.